Well, I want to take the last few minutes uh, and talk about the nose for neurosurgeons. Today, I see all over the world uh, increasingly endoscopic approaches being done to skull base. And we may stand there and help, but do we really understand the nose? So the last uh, 10 or so minutes is going to be the nose for neurosurgeons. So when we look into the nose, we see nasal septum made up above by perpendicular plate and vomer. We see inferior and middle concha and inferior meatus below inferior turbinate and middle meatus. But if you look in the anterior nasal aperture, this opening, in anterior opening into the nasal cavity, what's the first prominence you see here? What is that? Anyone? Please help me. That's, it opens below the inferior turbinate. So that's what? Nasal lacrimal duct. Uh, so now, if you look upward between the middle turbinates, you see the cribriform plate. It really is a tiny, narrow channel. The question is, how do you go from here, looking up there, to here, to an opening that extends over to the medial edge of the orbits? How did the cribriform plate is no wider than the olfactory bulb? So this is bulb width. And here's the exposure of anterior fossa that's being done endoscopically in some centers. So how do you get from here to here? Now, another situation is going to the clivus. And clival lesions are being increasingly exposed uh, uh, transnasally today. But as you look at clivus, clivus is wider at the bottom than it is at the top. And if you look at it from the front, what is this sticking down that blocks access to approaches to the lower two-thirds of the clivus? But you, you don't see the lateral edge of the clivus. It's hidden behind the pterygoid process and medial pterygoid plate. So to get to lateral edge of clivus, you have to understand how to widen uh, that opening. So let's start out back in nasal cavity. Here's nasal lacrimal duct. Now we look in septum. And this is, we're on right side now, right nostril. This is inferior turbinate, middle turbinate. Now, uh, if we work above, we can see a superior turbinate, sometimes a supreme. But the sphenoid ostia is going to be at the back edge of the turbinates, usually just a few millimeters above the back edge of whatever the highest turbinate is right here. Now, and here we just see the sphenoid ostia and the back edge of the turbinate chair. And this area, the thin anterior wall of the sinus through which the ostia open is the sphenoid concha, just this thin anterior wall. Now, where we see the nasal lacrimal duct, and here is the middle turbinate, and we pull it medially toward the septum. What are we going to see next now? 
as we look in the metal meatus under the metal turbinate we see this right here and what's that called uncinate process and behind the uncinate process we see the ethmoid bulla. So now, what is the uncinate process? Well, the uncinate process is like pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, here we see the middle turbinate. We pulled it over. We saw the mucosa lining the uncinate process. And the uncinate process if you talk to ENT, anteriorly there's an opening here that's the anterior fontanelle. And then along the posterior edge of the uncinate process, in the bone it's open, that's the posterior fontanelle. So this area is like pediatric neurosurgery with fontanelles, except that when you operate, the anterior fontanelle is covered by mucosa. The posterior fontanelle covered by mucosa. Uh, but here we see uncinate process, septum, ethmoid bulla. Now, opening the bulla is the key to the floor of the anterior fossa, of widening it. And behind the uncinate process that overlies, well, the, that bony process, is the semilunar hiatus between the uncinate process and the bulla. So that, and if you look in, in back of this with an endoscope, why, in, we call this the semilunar hiatus. And this hiatus in back of the uncinate process, uh, in back of the uncinate process, the semilunar hiatus, is where you see the drainage of the frontal duct, some of the ethmoids. And if you follow the hiatus down, you see the drainage of the maxillary sinus. So a step along the way to widening this approach is you divide the uncinate process above and below and then you can fold it or bite it off usually it's bitten off or a shaver takes it off and then you're looking at the bulla the air cells of the ethmoids in the middle meatus and at the bottom of the semilunar hiatus you have the opening of the maxillary duct Here's the top of the inferior turbinate. And you can enlarge the opening into the maxillary sinus. Uh, but here's the opening into the maxillary sinus. Here's the bulla. Now the bulla are open here lateral to the cribriform plate to give you that wider access. So you work through the anterior ethmoid air cells lateral to the cribriform plate to the floor of the anterior fossa and this bone forms the what is that if you open that while you're into orbit that's lamina papricia forming the medial wall of the orbit and you can work forward here all the way to frontal sinus. Uh, there are angle drills today that allow you to uh, open the floor of the frontal sinus. And you can open back to the sphenoid. Here we see what canal? Vidian, rotundum, ovale, a spontaneous dehiscence over the cavernous carotid the optic canal. Uh, and you look at the anterior fossa going uh, through that middle meatus removing ethmoid labyrinth 
you get this exposure of anterior fossa, anterior and posterior ethmoidal or anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, cribriform plate. The ethmoid labyrinth has been opened up to the uh, uh, frontal bone forming the uh, floor of anterior fossa. Uh, but you have access then to all of this area. Uh, you can work down medially even to C1, C2. Uh, and here we see the cribriform plate area, the olfactory mucosa, the uh, anterior ethmoidal arteries. And you want to take those if you're going to sacrifice them a little bit medial toward the uh, olfactory mucosa because there's some cases where they were divided laterally and retracted into the orbit and caused significant orbital hematomas. And always accompanying the ethmoidal arteries are these little ethmoidal nerves to the nose. You can do an osteotomy around the cribriform plate. Here's the olfactory mucosa preserved. And then dura open, uh, and then Fox divided to open the area. And you have this kind of exposure um, uh, aided by the removal of that ethmoidal labyrinth. There are a few cases now where the olfactory mucosa has been preserved, attached to the bulbs, and folded downward during removal of the pathology. And then the closure is done so that uh, this mucosa is still in the roof of the nasal cavity attached to the bulbs, and olfaction has been preserved. But I think that's uh, difficult. Now, expanding the approach laterally down in this area, and, and I'll get done here quickly, but here we're looking at lateral wall of nasal cavity. And if you're going to go through a pterygoid process, by here we are again, middle meatus, middle turbinate, nasal septum will be over here, lateral wall of nasal cavity above the inferior turbinate right in this area. And then you start to elevate that mucosa. And uh, here we see the sphenopalatine artery at the foramen. Uh, and you enlarge that opening. And here we have pterygoid process of sphenoid, maxillary artery, sphenopalatine artery, vidia nerve, V2 at rotundum. And you can enlarge that opening then. It's better if you can do this all submucosally to get into the base of the pterygoid process that can be drilled away to widen the exposure to give you access to the clivus. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these approaches tomorrow. But for closure, here we're looking at nasal septum, upper part supplied by ethmoidal arteries, lower part, larger part, the greatest part by the sphenopalatine arteries. And here we see septum, maxillary artery coming through, and sphenopalatine foramen. These arteries supply septum, and they also go into the turbinates, uh, large pieces that can aid in closure to give a vascularized flap. But here, the branches coming on the septum for the nasal septal flaps. These flaps can be turned into the anterior fossa or laid down the clivus. And these flaps can be very large uh, and include most of the nasal mucosa on one side. You have to preserve that arterial supply. You want to preserve the area of the olfactory mucosa. And uh, these flaps uh, 
can be used to close large defects in anterior fossa or clivus, anterior fossa or downward in clivus. And uh, these flaps also, in addition to including the nasal septum, they can extend down across the hard palate to the lateral wall of the nasal cavity up under the inferior turbinate. So this extended flap along the palate up laterally under the, na the inferior turbinate gives uh, a huge flap for aiding in these closures. We review a lot of this anatomy in the book. Uh, one of our aims is to get this nose for neurosurgeon uh, into this collection that's downloaded uh, at no charge. But all of this has been about making what is a delicate, faithful, awesome experience for our patient more accurate, gentle, and safe. Thank you.